each week because I notice people get confused and start writing in the soon to be copied section versus the today's date section. Oh, yeah. It happened last week too. Like either move this all the way to the end of the dock, which would be cumbersome because then you'd have to scroll or just stick it in its own dock and move it over each week. But yeah, if you look at like attendees and stuff, people kind of split where they sign in and whatnot. It's a little confusing. Yeah, I know that can be confusing. Speaking of which, we should probably do the traditional, here's the share <clears throat> to the actual agenda and meeting minutes. And if you could add yourself to the attendees, please, that's super helpful. Prime example, Ed, you just typed your name in really what's supposed to be next week's minutes. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, it did say September 3rd. Right. Next meeting. Uh, oh, I, now they got rid of that because there's also a September 3rd directly below that, too. We've got two calls on every other Tuesday. And oh. I copied the meeting notes over prior to 10 o'clock. Ah. Oh. Oh. That's, okay. So it's 8 a.m. GMT. Worth, it's probably worth carefully marking. Um, okay, you have actually carefully marked this 8 a.m. GMT, 10 a.m. CAT. Okay, cool. So yeah, that, that explains it. It's the China meeting. Got it. So we, I'm actually going to add something here for um, a readout from the China meeting. The color code, maybe. Have the earlier time be blue. <laughs> I, I'm a huge fan of color, of appropriate color. Um, I, I'm not terribly great at selecting color palettes myself, but if you give me a color palette, I will use the hell out of it. So, as many of you have seen in the slides that I produce. Um, okay, so we're at six after. You want to get going, Frederick? Sure, let's get started. So welcome to the Network Service Mesh meeting. And so uh, we have this particular meeting scheduled every week at 8 a.m. Pacific. We have two meetings which are currently on hiatus, uh, NSM doc meeting, which occurs every Wednesday at 8 a.m. when it's not on hiatus. And the same with the use case, which occurs every second, fourth, and fifth Monday. Um, and so, we also have a new meeting, which um, uh, it, ha it, occur it occurs every two weeks, right, right, Nikolai? Nikolai's not actually on the call today. I think he's on vacation. Ah, well, it should. I think Radoslav or, or Ivana should be able to comment as well. Yeah, um, yeah, Nikolai is on PTO. Uh, and yeah, this uh, age friendly meeting is happening every two weeks. You're right. Great, and so I believe we just had a meeting today. So the next meeting will be two weeks from now, which should be, see today's what, the third? So maybe the 16th? Yeah, I'm possibly on the 16th. And so we also have a CNCF telecom user group, which occurs uh, every first Monday at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific and every third Monday at 4 a.m. Pacific. The next meeting will be Monday, September 16th at 4 a.m. So that's not one that we run, but it is one that we participate in. Um, and I'm gonna remove the CNCF networking working group at the moment because I don't think that's currently running. So <laughs> major events coming up. We have ONS Europe in Antwerp with four accepted talks and a uh, telecom user group meetup and a CNCF testbed tutorial. We have Open Source Summit coming up in Lyon with one, with one talk accepted by Ivana and Radoslav. We have KubeCon uh, and CloudNativeCon North America coming up um, in November 18th through 21st with NSMCon announced with a call for proposals. And uh, we'd like to remind you that we're, uh, we're aiming to close the call for proposals on September 13th. So please get your uh, please get your proposals in before then. Yeah, so it should also also be noted that we actually are also open for sponsorship. With that. So 
And with that, uh, let's jump. Uh, so do we have any announcements that we uh, that we need to do? Well, well, hey Jeffrey, I'm going to push your thing right after the social media community thing, and then we'll jump straight into the call reboot. So, okay. uh, uh, Lucina, are you on? Good day. Yes, I've got a quick update for folks regarding the N Service Mesh Twitter account. Since last week, uh, 17 new followers, and we hit the 400 followers mark. So I posted a Ooh. thank you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Posted a little congrats and thanks on Twitter. Um, 15 new accounts following and 15 tweets and retweets. I posted about our Open Networking Summit talks next uh, in a couple of weeks, as well as a reminder for the two Tuesday working group meetings today. And uh, also posted today a call for CFPs with the close date of September 3rd. Oh, that's great. Um, has the OVS orbit been announced? If so, I'll go ahead and retweet and promote that. Yeah, I, I forgot to announce it, and uh, I was going to say it after you, after you. But uh, yes, it's it's it was released like maybe a day or two ago. Yep. Um, what other I'll mention that I need to get the details on as well. So we got that going on. I believe that we're doing a, a CNCF webinar October third. I need to get all the details on that. Um, so I will try and get that pulled together for you guys. And once we have a link, you can promote that as well. Sounds great. I'll add both of those to um, this week's plan. Yay. Excellent. So I, I think it's incredible that we're still getting almost 5% growth week on week. It's just insane. In terms of number of followers. Yes, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. It'll really uh, bump up once we're at yeah, Open Networking Summit. May, uh... Europe. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, a little bit of lag on the call. Uh, you first. Ah, just excited to see the bump. The last open, the last KubeCon event. I believe we've got 200 followers in that four-day stretch. <laughs> so I'm excited to see <laughs> uh, the the growth in a couple of weeks once we're at Open Networking. Open Networking Summit. For, for those of you who are giving talks in various places, it would probably be great if you could um, include the Twitter handle as part of your talk so that people could go and, and follow as well. Thank you so much. That concludes my update. And please let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see on the N Service Mesh account this week. Thank you so very much. You've done an incredible, you continue to do an incredible job. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Ed beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to talk faster than I do. Yeah. Thank Maybe. You. <laughs> um, okay, we have the uh, call reboot. Uh, Jeffrey, you're, uh, uh, you have the floor. Okay, um, so we're kind of past the summer um, travel events. Uh, I think what is ONS the only one in EU that's right around the corner? It just happened, um, but we kind of hit a break just because there was a lot of conferences right around like the June July time frame, and um, I think everybody's kind of back on a normal schedule. Um, weekly might be a little too often. It seemed like people were getting a little. Um, oversaturated and we probably just need time in between to like actually write documentation. But um, Ed added some suggestions for the guides. I think we should start a guide section. Um, we've got like some kind of pre-canned use cases and I'd like to write um, idiots guides for getting DNS or into domain working. Um, I'm doing a lot of like multi-cluster stuff. So I'll probably definitely dive in pretty hard on the inner domain one. Um, but like you said, um, we've kind of we've got the um, the glossary done. We can boot back up the um, the kind of like picture book spreadsheet that goes along with the glossary that kind of gives visuals with um, the definitions. And then, like I said, we should do these guides. Additionally, I'd like to maybe at least um, once a month, once we get closer to the different events, is also have like um kind of like a peer review for people who want to bring like their presentations that they are going to take to these different talks. Um, we can help, you know, just basically 
with technical technical accuracy. Um, give suggestions if people get writer's block or like I don't really know how to like make this flow, but I'm I want to make it in a you know basically collaborative space for people who are looking for help as they're getting their talks out there. Um, and then yeah, I don't know. So I'll open it up and um, get people's thoughts on maybe doing it biweekly as opposed to weekly, et cetera. And if there's anything else that we want to add to the documentation section besides the guides and the overview, then feel free. Yeah, I, th I think the, the having a space for people to review doc talks might be very, very helpful. I know, you know, often just having another set of eyes look at what you're doing for your talk helps you to discover places where you're unkilled, where you could be more clear. Cool. Great. So <coughs> we have the um, readout for the biweekly user friendly NSM meeting. So let's see, there is a bookmark. So do you, who wants to do the readout? Should I, I do just, it or do you want to? A quick comment. Um, I was on mute, so sorry. Um, I think um, speaking personally, I, I think a lot of people feel this when they're doing presentations is you feel like you don't want to take other people's slides. I think it would be good if we kind of had a steal with pride these this set of slides so that we, you know, if, if there's some introductory text or something where we can, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, no, I, I think that's that's brilliant. And we definitely want to encourage that, Brian. Um, right. I know we do have a, a, a folder up on Google for Network Service Mesh mm -hmm. that is chock-a-block full of things that the entire reason they're there is to be stolen. Um, yeah. okay. <laughs> so please steal with pride. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that goes with anything that's on the website as well. And I'd also like to point out that it's under a permissive license. And so <clears throat> you, can, uh, you can steal things there uh, and know that, uh, that you're licensed to do so. Okay. But that's actually a really good point though, Brian. I, I, have a, I typically have a page where I'll provide a QR code on most of my slides that takes you to where the slides are. I think right. it will definitely add a steal with pride statement to that, that page. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> cool. Sorry, back to the biweekly Asia friendly readout. Great. So let's see, let me jump up to the current one. So um, they also added, let me see if I can find the right location. Okay, so the so the biweekly uh, announcements included. It looks like they have a set of Q and A's that they added to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So we should probably get to them. Um, so questions were IPs for clients and endpoints, uh, and uh, they don't have any for the rest uh, in the chain. So people are asking how routing works. Uh, are these things that what do we want to do in these scenarios? Are we going to answer them here. With, and then we can link them back to a recording at a future time. Or another option that I think would be a bit better might be just to copy these questions to a uh, Google Doc, and then we can have a readout in the in the Asia. That way, we get data flowing to and from. What do the folks think who are actually in the Asia meeting? I think uh, this. They, they are very useful uh, for the maybe project documentation. They receive their answers during the meeting, so it's not specifically for that meeting, but uh, we found it useful to, to write the questions that people may have. Cool. No, but this is, this is super good because people do have questions, <clears throat> and, and, and it, it's almost impossible when you're too deep in something to fully understand the questions that would occur to people when they're getting, they're just getting used to it. And so getting these questions out and, and getting answers to them is incredibly useful. Yeah, and in fact, um, it's difficult to get people to, to ask questions as well because people often feel uh, like they don't want to look bad or they don't want to uh, show that they don't understand something and it's like, um, we're we're better off asking questions than, than not, but uh, it, the, the the human aspect prevents us, prevents us from asking on occasions. So, and, and the um, thing, network service mesh is not super complicated, but it's very different from the stuff that we spent the last forty years wrapping our heads around. So, it, it is it is a new space. 
Yeah, and more, more specifically, um, this is something that I, I think we're going to see in the community. I've had a couple conversations with people within the community about this. Uh, people are sometimes afraid to come talk to either me or Ed directly, but then when they talk with all of you, they may they may voice uh, things that they don't fully understand and bring up concerns because of that uh, because of that or. There, there might be concerns that are legitimate, but they won't bubble it up to us because they feel like they don't want to criticize or so on. Um, and so uh, don't, uh, my recommendation is don't worry about it if, if you feel like it's criticism uh, or if you hear something that looks, sounds like it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, feel free to bubble it up. You don't have to tell us who it came from. If, if you or them don't feel comfortable. So, you know, the, part of this feedback, part, part of what we're trying to develop is this healthy feedback of information. And because it means one of two things, either we ended up uh, not stating a question, either we did not explain it well enough, which, then it's our fault that we didn't explain it well enough, or we genuinely missed something important and it needs to be brought up, in which case that's our fault as well. Uh, but uh, we're not mind readers as well. So we, we need this feedback and dialogue in order to resolve things, so. Yeah. It, it has to be a conversation. Uh, cool, so there's questions on auto heal. Uh, the question was on whether, auto, on how auto heal is triggered. Um, and the, um, the, in, the answer appears to be based upon updating the specification with connection details and gRPC. Um, and there was a question on whether we can make the trigger be more detailed than the, uh, the, than the namespace. Do we have a notion yeah. of what people had in mind with that question about making the trigger more detailed than the namespace? Um, actually, this, uh, the questions below how to heal were, uh, were asked on the previous uh, meeting that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Andre answered, answered those. So if he's okay. on the call, yeah. Awesome. No, Andre is a good source for such things. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. OK, awesome. <clears throat> All right, then. Um, Anything else from the Azure Friendly meeting before we bounce back up to the main agenda? Yeah, and there were a couple more quick cases, questions on uh, on interdomain use cases um, and on how many people were getting involved. Um, I think uh, I, I think these are things that I'd like to come up with better. And I say better. I mean, I, I don't know what it was answered in the in the Asia meeting, and I'm sure that it was sufficient in that scenario. But I would like to actually come up with some good uh, literature. Like we we're we're talking about a potential frequently asked questions over time, where we can add these type of questions. So, okay, sounds good. I mean, this might also be something. Um, I don't know, Jeffrey. Do you want to try and see if we can take some of these questions and maybe produce a fact of some sort in the docs call? Yeah, I mean, we should probably just have a Q&A section on the website that we maintain with the real prevalent questions. I'm kind of curious about the second to last answer too. I mean, is that now like a plan of messing with the CNI? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's some interesting discussions there. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things we've sort of fundamentally done is say, look, um, leave the CNI plugin alone um, because people have radically different opinions about what CNI plugins they want to use. Um, you know, and, and so, but, but at the same time, we do keep coming across people who want to be able to interpose things um, in front of the CNI, like say, for example, some complicated IPS or some other thing that provides value that you want that you're not going to get from a CNI. So you love your Calico, you don't want to switch out your Calico, but there's something extra you would like, um, that kind of thing. And so we, we are getting a bunch of people raising that. Um, so I, I think we want to maintain the position of, you know, you don't have to change your CNI, you don't have to change your Kubernetes, but there might be something interesting to explore there. Okay. Yeah, because I, what, part of what I think I'm hearing from hearing in your, your question there, Jeffrey, is um, don't make me change my CNI. Is that fair? Yeah, one of the big draws to me for NSM was the fact that it's completely orthogonal to the CNI, but whatever people do what they'll do um, to the original question though. We absolutely um, need to start like bringing these in. I should probably comb the mailer too and find some of the relevant questions um, that 
obviously like giant, like four paragraph answers and stuff aren't the types of things, but um, I think a little Q and A thing, we might even collectively on the call just recollect some of the previously commonly asked questions, add some answers and then um, mm -hmm. try a, like a dot MD or something for the, the, um, the Git and then put it on the website as well. Yep. Yep. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah, and and for clarity, uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the CMI path, uh, part of the reason part of what we're looking at is uh, is an interpose. So basically, think of it as uh, like I was talking with one security vendor recently as an example, and one of the problems we're having is that they wanted to have a intrusion detection and security uh, uh, system that they want to be able to inject in to uh, to the network in Kubernetes, but they don't have any way to to put position themselves between the uh, the pod and the uh, and the network, and so this would give them the possibility of of potentially injecting themselves in the middle, and then the connection ends up going to the uh, to the uh, CNI after that. But the main the main use cases uh, are centered around being orthogonal, and I, I think that's where we would still prefer people people go with this. I mean, is, let, me, let me let me sort of make a very unequivocal statement um, that I think probably most of the main contributors to network service mesh will agree with, which is whatever else we do, uh, the ability to use NSM as completely orthogonal to CNI will remain. Exactly. Does that make you feel better, Jeffrey? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. You guys are product managers. You're trying to expand your customer base. The, the purist in me gets a little queasy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the trick there is to not actually spoil what, what actually is magic when you do that. And, and hopefully, you know, as I said, the, the ability to simply come in as an app, as an orthogonal thing is a big part of that in my mind. So, so um, we have... Uh, state of the project. So, uh, Ed, you have the floor. Sure. Um, so recently landed, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, so I, I believe, Denise, you said the DNS is now fully landed in the repo, correct? Uh, yes, hello, it, it is correct. Awesome. So, um, and do we have documentation for how folks can use it yet, or is that stuff we're still working on? <clears throat> Uh, I've updated documentation, but if you uh, face it with some problems, uh, let me know. Okay. I'll update documentation. Cool. So, I mean, for, for folks who are, are you know, who haven't been paying attention to the DNS site, this is actually cool because one of the things that is true is if I have a network service and my pod connects to a network service, or even worse, my pod connects to multiple network services, um, I need to be able to get DNS from those network services, but I also need to continue to get the DNS from my Kubernetes. And so what this DNS feature does is it allows those network services when they come up to return a DNS context um, that will cause us to fan out across any and all DNSs that are provided by the network services as well as the Kubernetes DNS and you know, get responses from all of them. And whoever comes across the finish line with a positive response first, that's the DNS that we return to the client. Um, and the result of this is that you can actually then be very, very, very consumable from applications because your application simply comes up and does its DNS thing just like it always does. And it can't see any of the details of how the magic works under the covers. But if you're example.com and you have a special magical DNS behind your VPN, that can actually be reachable by that pod. Cool. And then the first pass of the interdomain stuff, I think, um, has also landed. Artem, is that correct? Uh, yes, you're right. Excellent. Um, and how do we stand on sort of the documentation for the interdomain stuff in terms of people who want to go kick the tires? Uh, we have some documentation for interdomain, but I think we have things to improve. Okay, cool. Because I know there are a lot of people very interested. And, and for those of you who are, are newer, interdomain is basically, historically speaking, we've when we've done networking, we've welded our connectivity domain for networking to a particular runtime domain. So you have Kubernetes networking for your cluster. You have a VPC in your AWS. You have the data center network for your data center. And it's all essentially welding the networking to the places where things run. 
Um, and with interdomain, we can finally, to the best of my knowledge, for the first time, um, have connectivity domains that are attached specifically and only to the workloads that are relevant to the work you're doing. So you can have, you know, essentially, <clears throat> you know, crossing domain boundaries, you can have a single connectivity domain that is only accessible to some, but not all of the workloads in that runtime domain. So I can have some pods in one Kubernetes cluster, but not the whole cluster, some pods in another that can actually get on the same network service and be connected. So that's actually incredibly exciting. Cool. So then um, in progress, I, I know security was getting very close and then Ilya went on a well-deserved vacation. Uh, is there anything from here that you wanted to terribly update us on, Ilya? Oh, hi. Uh, actually, no, today I rebased my PR uh, on new interdomain and their stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, disable security for interdomain tests because it requires some extra work for that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, in a few days or maybe tomorrow uh, the third pair will be ready. Excellent. Now, this is super exciting. Um, I don't know if you, for the folks who are familiar with Spiffy Inspire, but the sort of industry best practices for handling identity. And so we will then be essentially have secure authentic authenticatable identity. And there's some other cool things coming down the pike, including I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see some work to be able to use open policy agent. So that rather than your network service endpoint having to understand who it does and doesn't want to admit, um, you can essentially use OPA for that and it can delegate. Uh, and, and effectively then the mesh becomes the authority on what clients you'll accept. Oh, Ed, uh, is there any updates about uh, service accounts and deploying ports that we discussed? Uh, so not so far. Um, I would say actually we should proceed the way you've been doing service accounts at the moment because <clears throat> my, we've been checking with the Spiffy Spire guys, that's how they were doing it. Um, and I'm still a little suspicious of it, but I've yet to find the right person in Kubernetes land um, with regards to the service account stuff. Um, so I'm still digging there. I'd say proceed with the stuff that you've got for service accounts. For, the, for those of you who are not part of this particular discussion on the PR, um, there's some question about what the right way to set service accounts for Kubernetes is, and their documentation is a little in there. Um, and so we've taken one available choice. We just want to make sure it's the canonical available choice. Okay. Uh, and since Kubernetes service accounts are one of the things that figures into the selectors for Spire for issuing identity, um, it does matter. The good news is that, you know, even if we picked the wrong one, going back and fixing to the right one is not super hard at the end of the day. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Awesome. Um, SRV6 support. <clears throat> um, so Artem, I know you've been sort of plowing forward on this. Uh, yep. So including, if I recall, having to go push bugs up, bug fixes upstream to uh, Legato. And I think you're also working on a bug fix upstream to BPP itself. So you've definitely been busy. Yeah, we still have few blocking issues from VPP side. OK. Awesome. And I, I think we're missing our, our, our favorite proponent of IP, uh, SRV6 today, but I'm sure he will be happy to hear. Um, Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, so, oh, and there's also a discussion I just wanted to bring people's attention to. Right now, the remote mechanism support for does BNI selection in the network service manager. And um, just talking about moving that into the NSM forwarder from the NSM manager um, on issue 1411, that strikes me as probably being a good idea, but I did want to make sure that I gave that a little bit of, of promotion here as a discussion to look at. Uh, Radislav, do you want to talk about what's going on in the kernel forwarding plane? Um, yeah. Um, so uh, lately, I'm I'm working on adding uh, support for metrics. Um, yeah, as you as you know, yesterday we had a little discussion about uh, how to how to how to say it how to address each metric. Uh, for instance, should it be by interface per pod or interface per per namespace? Or per connection, mm -hmm. so yeah, the, there are ongoing discussions about that. Uh, I believe we have a 
solution that you suggested yesterday. So yeah. we'll look I at mean, that. And if you find any if you find any problem with the solution I suggested, do do bubble it up. Um, I have been known to practice drive-by architecture, which can be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it did seem more sense to make them part of the, the labels. Because I, I can think of lots of other useful places that wouldn't consume mechanisms that would consume labels, where it might be useful to know the pod name um, or eventually things like the pod node name or the, the node name that you're running on. Mm -hmm. and the nice thing yeah. about labels is they're, they're just sort of a bag of strings. Um, <clears throat> so you can use them in all kinds of flexible ways. Yeah. Actually, this was brought, by, brought up by the work that Ivana is doing. Um, mm -hmm with uh, the service mesh interface. Uh, yep. Let me actually, yeah, yeah. Let me actually bubble that up then before the refracting to simplify since it's sort of thematically together here. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I know, uh, Ivana, you've been working on things around metrics, which is really exciting. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes. Uh, about uh, first for the pods, I'm now testing for the client side and I think the uh, exposing in the endpoint connection labels will be a bit more tricky, but I'll start partial. I started with the client. You're a little bit faint. I, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Do, do you hear me? Now I hear you brilliantly. Yes. Oh, okay. So uh, I, I'm testing, uh, I added labels to the, for a uh, pot name label to the client side and I'm testing this and uh, I'll uh, yes, maybe next week I'll look at the endpoint because uh, I'll start preparing my ONS talk uh, as a priority before that. Uh, and uh, this issue uh, that uh, we've opened previously with the VPP forwarding plane, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis uh, took a look last week and he, he found a bug in the Legato VPP agent and there were uh, comment from the uh, VPP agent community members there and they said that uh, it's planned like that not to uh, to send metrics because there there will be a lot of uh, traffic that uh, will uh, re reduce performance and uh, they have uh, let me I forgot the name but I have it open telemetry uh, that is directly integrated with Prometheus. Uh, so I think Dennis said as he started working on this that he would look at integrating this with the VPP agent. So yeah. that we, for the VPP agent, we will have directly metrics with uh, Prometheus. Uh, and that's why I focused uh, the work on the kernel forwarder because uh, there we won't have uh, Prometheus integration. And I'm now uh, on this uh, on after the pod names because uh, just for the wider community, uh, we want to expose pod names because we want uh, better observability from uh, from uh, people's side. They want to see uh, which pod to which communicates and what are those metrics <coughs> for. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, they, they, if they search a query in Prometheus, they will need this. They will search for this information, so that's why we need to change that. No, that that's definitely true. Um, the the one thing to keep in mind as you're doing the work, and I, I don't necessarily know what the result of keeping this in mind will be, is that because we do have interdomain support, um, it is going to it, it may possibly be true that I may have a pod name in one cluster and a different pod name in another cluster. Um, so you, you, you may want to think a little bit about how you want to handle those situations as well. So um, I don't know what the right answer is there. I'm just sort of suggesting it. I, th I think in, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, in my, what I think for interdomain is that uh, traffic will uniquely go with uh, the one cluster or the another. So I think that the metrics, if someone looks for metrics for a specific pot, uh, it will be fine uh, in no matter what the cluster is and there is a very rare chance of collision. Oh, oh, so that, no, that I think you're right about. Um, so, but you know, it's just something to, to keep in the back. The other domain is something to keep in the back of your mind. It, 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 I, it may not even be an issue here. It's just something that's a hold in the back of your mind as you work through this. 
Cool. So excellent. Thank you. Um, all right then. <clears throat> um, so I think Andre, you're working on the ref the refactor to simplify uh, on the uh, SDK stuff, evolution stuff. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah, it's uh, mostly ready for review. Uh, I just have one test failing on OCI, and today work it on uh, fi fixing a bucket uh, issue we have. Uh, so okay. for for it, I have two requests at the moment. One is improving uh, open tracing stuff, and one is for SDK. SDK just need to one test to be fixed. So you can take a look for it. I already Excellent. asked guys, uh, sorry to look to this pull requests. Yeah, so and, and for folks who haven't been keying up with the SDK evolution, this is essentially a simplification of how we chain together small bits of functionality in the SDK. Because one of the things that we realized in is for net, when you're writing a network service endpoint, there is a small amount of stuff that you actually care about that's interesting or unique to your network service endpoint. And the vast majority of things that you would want to do um, are actually um, the same things that everyone wants to do. And so we've constructed the whole thing as a, as a composable chain where you get little snippets of functionality. So if you say want to write a network service endpoint where you're using VVP agent, you just drop in the thing that will connect the incoming connection to VVP agent. Um, and then if you want to you know, have an outgoing client for that incoming connection, there's literally just a one line that you drop in to do that and so on. Um, and so it ends up being a, a nice simple way to evolve this stuff forward. Um, the other thing that Andre mentioned is the, we've actually brought the um, tracing from, from Jaeger and open tracing all the way into the individual internal chain elements. So you can get a very granular picture of what's actually happening as you chain through, not only in terms of functionality and longing, but in terms of uh, timing. So if you say sit down and write it on a C and it turns out to be really slow, you can see exactly where it's really slow and why. So it's kind of exciting. And then I think next up after that is trying to refactor the network service manager in a similar way um, <clears throat> so that it becomes easier to reason about it because um, it's gotten a little complicated in there. And also because uh, we have various people wanting to write proxy network service managers and other things uh, or network service managers for other environments. And this will hopefully make it enormously easier for them to do that um, by making it simpler because you only then have to you know, substitute in the piece of the chain that's different for your local environment. Um, and then the last one that's a little bit more uh, involved is, you may want to go take a look at the issue, is the linearization of the local to remote calls and network service manager. Um, this essentially what it means is right now, if you get a request from pod saying, hey, I want to talk to a network service, there's a lot of complicated logic around whether that network service is remote or that network service is local. And, and this is sort of branching of logic that turns out to create a lot of complica complication. And by simply saying, look, if you get a local request in, we always make a remote request. It vastly simplifies things, even if that remote request is just looping back to the same network service manager. And it turns out this also gives you the ability to do the create proxy network service manager that we've been talking about for a while, um, which I know people have been very excited about. So. Cool. Anything else, Andre, before we move on to Ed Valenti? No, no, no. Cool. Ed, thank you so much for making the call. I do appreciate it. Hey, sure. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, two Eds are better than one. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the the uh, issue of the week of the weekend um, Labor Day. Um, had to do with uh, a situation that I don't completely understand yet, but in practice was that the NSM project uh, created a whole bunch of requests at once to packet, I believe to destroy machines. And uh, due to current limitations uh, in how we handle things, um, caused an undesired uh, stability uh, or instability in packet. Um, we, we know that on our side we need to do better and so there's work underway to um, 
re-architect a little bit of the uh, uh, request queuing stuff uh, and also speed up some portions of that. Um, but it also looked like there were changes on the, the NSM side. Uh, there's a PR 1546 uh, yep. from Andre, uh, which look like they will address those. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll be watching this closely. Um, you know, we've got internal monitoring to, that we can break out requests uh, by, mm -hmm. by API key. Um, and uh, if anything comes up, I know how to reach you all. Yeah, we're, we're very sorry that we turned out to be a source of instability. We, we were very grateful to you guys for all you do for us. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we very rapidly uh, fixed the problem. Um, and I hope that's what we've actually done. Uh, do you want to say a few words, Andre, about what you think the fix was here? Uh, yeah, for packet uh, problem, uh was following. Uh, if timeout was set to about 10 minutes for provisioning of a cluster, and if timeout was reached, uh, our cloud testing tool decided uh, what we could not uh, uh, continue with this one and need to destroy all, all resources we created. And uh, Packet API return uh, what destroys not possible while resources queue it or in provisioning state. So we need to wait uh, in any case uh, for a status change. So uh, in pull request, I've had the following changes. So if this is happening, the start is valid by timeout for any other error and uh, deleting also causes error. Uh, our testing tool will not try to create uh, any more clusters with this identifier uh, for this cluster provider. So at least it will not flood uh, with uh, invalid requests. Uh, of course, build will fail, but at least you'll be able to check what's happening uh, mm -hmm. without uh, leaking uh, a lot of resources and uh, flooding uh, cloud infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing I might suggest that if you guys are looking in this area to begin with, um, because I've actually run into this occasionally, even manually. Um, the fact that, so when every now and again, for various reasons, servers get wedged coming up and they can be wedged for a very long time. Um, right. And and I can't, and so if, if, if it's sort of gotten, if it's been going long enough that it's super obviously wedged, um, then I really can't do anything um, because I can't delete it. It's clearly never gonna make it. So if it would be possible to queue up a deep provision um, request for that thing at any stage, even if it's not been fully provisioned, um, that would potentially be very helpful. Yeah, I, I saw the error message that came back from our library, something to the effect of, you can't delete it, it hasn't been created yet. Um, Which is normally a really smart thing, unless it's been wedged in the process of creation which is usually the case when we had a timeout. Right, and, and the timeout, I, I believe on our side is set for 25 minutes, but for you, you've been deploying these frequently enough that you know that if it's not up in whatever the time thing is, waiting an extra 10 minutes is not gonna do anything. Um, generally, I mean, you guys continue to improve, so who knows, but yeah, generally. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I think I saw a snippet of that error message that came from pack and go but I don't have it in front of me if if it's in a PR or somehow can be brought to my attention the specific um, the specific condition of you can't delete it it hasn't been created yet yeah, I think it's in the add pull request. It's a different pull request. Yeah, there was a second pull request that. that if, you could maybe, if you could maybe add it to a comment on 1546, since that is already watching that. Yeah. Uh, that would probably be a good place for him to find that information, because then it's one place for him to look. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and by the way, I, I presume, Andre, that this means that my sort of like running around in circle, you know, th there's a famous saying in English when in danger or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. 
Um, and I, I pushed a PR that was sort of like that to, re to reduce the retry count. I presume I should go ahead and close that, Andre, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, also, uh, I found uh, one more, not the issue, but an option for mm -hmm. at least packet. Uh, it's possible to set uh, some uh, automatic uh, cluster destroy uh, timestamp, uh, for example, destroy in a few hours. So probably I will try to set this value as well. Oh, that would be that would be fantastic. So because I know... Potentially will prevent uh, leaking of these clusters. Yeah, for us. That, that, that's a wonderful option because I know that you know the bane of our existence everywhere is leaking resources and, and right. And that's um, that's a that's a cloud wide problem, right? That's not a specific to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've occasionally had to go delete tens of Kubernetes clusters from various public cloud providers. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, at the moment, actually, the problem is if it's Circle CI. Sometimes, if we do uh, force push or trigger builds, uh, it silently closes all the stuff on the Circle CI, and our code is just not closing all the stuff properly. So some timeout, auto termination timeout, I think will be helpful in this area. And do you, are your tests predictably long enough or short enough that you know that having a cluster destroyed in a couple hours? Yeah, is yeah, 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 yeah. So usually uh, it's no more than one, uh, one and a half hour to execute all the test suites. Yeah, so the yeah, uh, about you know, kudos to whoever on your side put a sort of automatic timeout API thing in there, because I've not seen that for any of the public cloud stuff we're dealing with. Either. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, I don't remember when that went in, but I, I know that more than one person had asked for it, so. It's it's epically useful. Like I said, I wish I had it everywhere. Yeah, um, uh, that's one problem. It has no documentation, so I will <laughs> yeah, Okay, so. Try to use so it. Uh, the the absence of documentation for me is an opportunity to file a bug report in our documentation project. Okay. So um, make a note on that on, on 1546 as well or, or on the, whatever the PR is that you put in to put in the auto delete. Like I'd love to do this, but I can't figure it out. And I'll, I'll bounce that back and, and get that. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Cool. So is there anyone else who's got stuff in progress or that, that, I, I should, as recently landed in network service mesh that you want to go ahead and highlight what we're talking about this week's status of the project? Well, before we jump on, I, I got a quick question on that. So for the auto delete, uh, does that auto delete timer start when the, uh, on the initial instantiation or does that start uh, when the uh, system is, uh, is actually available? Um, I believe it's a timestamp um, that you can set to your desire. Um, I don't think it's a time from time T. It's just a specific time, time and date. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there should be documentation, and if there isn't, that's a that's a flaw which we will remedy. Oh, okay. 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 Perfect. Yeah, we we appreciate all you guys do, and and I. I how to put it. It's better for the feature to be there and undocumented than not be there at all, but documented is even better. <laughs> so I, I, I believe I believe the, the top of the uh, NSM dev channel says uh, documentation is the most important thing. So <laughs> this is true. This is true. But I, I've had more than one instance with various cloud providers where I've reached out to various contacts and said, um, how do we do this? And the response was, oh, yeah, that's not super well documented. And the documentation yeah. is literally an example line in a config file in a GitHub somewhere. Um, yeah. So you're not alone. All right, cool. Um, anything else that folks want to talk about in terms of state of the project with stuff that's recently landed or that's in progress or any of the rest of that? Cool. And I, I do apologize. I, far, I failed to pull forward the spec stuff this week. We should probably uh, briefly visit, revisit some of the spec things again, because I know, for example, like the hardware Nick conversation has sparked up again. We've got people who are expressing more interest on that side, which would be very, very helpful. All right, cool.
Right. Um, let's see. Uh, one last thing we should definitely bring up as well is so we have ONS coming up. Do we have enough people here to still? So ONS, I believe, is coming up the 23rd to the 25th? Yeah, around that time period. And, and so and I, I think at ONS, we've got you there, Andre is there. I think um, we've got Radoslav and Ivana. You're also going to be there, correct? Yeah. So the question is, do we want to cancel the meeting uh, the week of September 23rd through 25th um, because of ONS? Yeah, that's one question. Uh, we could still we could still run the meeting. Uh, we'll just uh, either be missing some people or we may be on the spotty connection. Okay. Well, I mean, the good news is you brought it up sufficiently early. We can sort of think about it and, and check in again next week and see what we think. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Awesome. Anything else? Um, let's see, I can't see the agenda anymore. Was there anything else on it or are we, uh, It'll still be shared. Let me stop and reshare. We're at the, we're at the bottom of the agenda. Uh, it's, it's my, it's, it's my, it's, it's my uh, connection. I was having some connection issues, so I dialed in. Okay. Um, cool. Well, with that, um, yeah, so I see we're at the end of the agenda. Is there anything else that anyone else would, uh, would like to bring up? Okay. Well, with that, Thank you very much for everyone attending and we will see you all again at the uh, same time next week. So you all have a good day. Thanks, cheers, bye. Bye-bye, cheers, bye. -bye. Cheers, bye.